would you, uh, would you just take a moment and welcome to our pulpit both Reverend Mike and Reverend Tina Hook. We didn't forget you, Mike. Hi, guys. Hey, I want to take a second. I want to take a second and do a shout out to the Walzacks that are going to be here on uh, midweek. Go listen to them talk. Oh, they're incredible. Make whatever plans you have to make. Be there to listen to them talk. They are amazing. Oh yeah, and Julie. They are amazing. Oh, you guys got a great lineup and everything. You got a great like I want to oh, be. Oh wow. So pastor just told me have fun. Uh, we're sorry in advance for everything that happens. So <laughs> dangerous to say. We Okay, so I'm going to do this now, and we'll, we're going to introduce ourselves in a we, uh, different way, but it's, oh, we're, it's so nice to be home <laughs> and see family and everything like that. It's so nice to be home. And um, I forgot what I was going to, oh, we were, if those people who don't know us, you're still family to us, um, and, uh, and hug around our neck and the whole thing, we were the uh, children's pastors for years. In fact, we taught all five of your kids, all five of, them. all five of them, and it was in the middle of children's church that God called us to go to Scotland. In the middle of it. We had That's all a whole other story. We had all the kids in front of us, and God said, go to Scotland. We're like, wow. <laughs> so... We had all five of the Giordano kids, and then we retired. One of the Giordanos were even there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead, dear. I'm sorry. Mate va, hula dunya. Good morning, everyone. Kimra ha shuv ula anju. How are you all today? Ishinia Michael Agustina Hook. Caristiona, I love her name in Gaelic. Uh, we are Mike. Michael and Christina or Tina Hook. Okay. Caris Yona. I love her name in Gaelic. Okay, go ahead. We are your missionaries to the Highlands of Scotland. Is uh wait. No, I'm here. Yeah, there. Sorry, we have to write this it's down. It's one of those things. Hami Bruyan Gaelic Nahalaba. I am speaking Scots Gaelic. Shehanin. It is a language spoken in the Highlands. We are kid people. We will always be kid people. But I will tell you right now that God has asked these kids people to step out of their comfort zone. If anybody actually wins that argument with God, you really need to tell me how because I have yet to do it. Yeah, I don't argue. Uh, and asked us to go to the to go back to the Highlands where we've been for five and a half years and plant the very first Assemblies of God Church ever to be planted there. Yeah. I am going to go vomit later, yeah. but that's all Scary right. Scary and exciting at the same time. Only God can put that together. But we believe that God has given us a word for every church that we're in, uh, and we're going to bring that word right now. So we have a lot to say about Scotland, just so that you guys know that. Yeah. Meet us back in the back. We'll tell you a lot more stories. God is on the move in Scotland. God Amen. is on the move here in America. God is on the move because do you know what? God will not be stopped. Amen. Amen. He said it. He means it. He'll do it. Amen. End of conversation. Amen. And when we were up there, we did a lot of kids' ministry because that was the need that was at two of the churches in Dornach that were there. We did Enlightening Kids. If you ever want to see how we uh, teach the kids, go to YouTube and find Enlightening Kids with a Z, or that's the way they say it, or a Z, and you'll find 248 videos. We learned how to do that. Uh, uh, with various characters on uh, YouTube, and uh, honestly, they're they're uh, they're so funny. This is th those videos are going to come back to haunt us when we're 80 years old. I swear, and everything. But we did that. We met, met the needs. Our goal is to ignite generations for Christ in the Highlands. And there's generations that go back three generations where Jesus is nothing more than a museum piece in the in the cathedrals. And there is less than 1%, less than 1%, which is hard to believe, of the Highlands never heard a clear message of who Jesus is. I know. And it's, it's very traditional. Apathy is a, one of those major, major challenges we have. But God. But God. Our favorite two words in the Bible is, but God has a plan. And when we go there, yes, God said plant a church, but he 
I misunderstood at one point, and he said, plant churches. I have no idea. We, we know the vision that God gave us, but God unfolds every piece of the vision. And, but God is going to unfold the s part of that. <laughs> That's my part. I'm going, oh, God, I'm scary. So <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. So we have lots of stories. We'd love to tell people about Lily. We would love to tell people uh, about Dawn, uh, our friends, and the churches that, are, that we worked with that are rooting us on to plant an Assemblies of God church, which is unusual. Uh, but we want to get right to the message. So are you guys all prepared? All right, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you. Prepare our hearts, O oh Lord God. Help us, O oh Lord Jesus. Open our hearts. Show us more of the rich jewels of your word, O oh Lord God, as you dig into our hearts, O oh Lord, and you reveal yourself. So, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, O oh Lord God. And in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Okay. All right, now this message we have for, for you this morning is about two people of great faith. We're going to be talking about faith. And one is from the Old Testament, and one is from the New Testament. And both survived terrifying storms, terrifying, unbelievable storms. Now, I'm talking about Noah and the ark and Peter walking on, on the water with Jesus. Now, these storms, like many of the storms written in the Bible, and everything is in the Bible for a reason, okay? There's nothing out of the Bible that wasn't supposed to be there. It's there for a reason. And these storms represent uh, various trials and circumstances that test our faith, that test our faith that we get to a point where you, we doubt God, that we would say, why? Job is a great example of that. That's a whole other sermon. But that we say, why? Why is this happening? Or my favorite, Lord, you know how old I am. And then he told me about Noah, who was 600. So crisis can come at any time like storms can brew up. We just saw in the south where a storm ripped through the south. And they're going through terrible crises. So, and these crises can be various things like financial, health, death, uh, you name it, they can happen all of a sudden. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, at the start of 2020, and some of you guys know that, know this bit of, of our lives, uh, we got a phone call from Mike's mom. Uh, his 25-year-old nephew died of a drug overdose. So we spent 24 hours... <laughs> canceling everything that we had scheduled, um, getting plane tickets, which are really not hard to, which are really not, it's really not easy to do last minute. And flying home, we got, we arrived home on a Tuesday, Wednesday morning, uh, Mike took Brandon's service and we stuck around for a week or so and hung out with the family. Listen, that, that kind of storm is ridiculous. Because you think, you look at it and you go, are you serious, God? Like, seriously? We gave up our lives. We sold our house. We did everything. We're not in touch with our families. And this happens? Gee, thanks. But God. Two of our favorite words in the Bible, but God. Because God took that storm, took us through it, gave us an amazing opportunity to, to speak Jesus into his sister's life. An amazing opportunity to speak Jesus into his family's life. And an amazing opportunity to show people what it means to follow Jesus. He gave us total strength to do what we couldn't do on our own. Um. And just a, a little reference on that, Brandon was the only grandchild in our family. We don't have kids. My brother and my uh, and his wife doesn't have kids. He was the only grandchild. He had a he he has a son, Jackson, and who um, lives right around the corner from my mother, with a family and, uh, and a younger brother and a sister. So, all right. So storms come up in just ways that make us doubt our faith. And so we want to help to give you an idea of what faith is in the middle of those storms. Point number one, 
Faith sees God's grace. Faith sees God's grace. I'm going to take you to Noah, okay? Uh, Noah, Genesis 7, 1 through 7. I'm going to say it quickly. Uh, the Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and, and one pair of every kind of uh, unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe uh, from the face of the earth every living creature that I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and their sons' wives entered the ark to escape the flood waters. Now, we all are very familiar with the story of Noah. We've heard it probably from our childhood up and may have even had toys that illustrated this story. But um, the, the main part about this whole thing is that God directed uh, him to build an ark to save his family and various kinds of animals from a destruction. God made him and the earth a promise not to destroy the world with water ever again with the sign of the rainbow. We've twisted that now, unfortunately. And as children love this story of hope, after it, it was a horrible catastrophe. The flood was probably the greatest catastrophe that ever was on the earth till now. And it was a horrible time at that point. But Noah was more than what he did. He was a man of great faith in God. Can you imagine being the only person who believed in something, anything, but something, literally the only person? That's what it says. And imagine holding fast to your faith when absolutely everyone else was doing the opposite. I can see I have been in point, uh, uh, places like that. And... Noah lived in what, as I said before, was once the most corrupt period in human history. By the time Noah was born, the earth was so filled with evil that God decided he would destroy all of it with water and start over. And God would save a remnant only, Noah and his family, to repopulate the earth. Now, Noah was far from perfect. He was just like you and me. But ultimately... His story is a story of faith. It's a portrait of a man who believed God despite the fact that everyone else thought probably he was crazy. God said of Noah, I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. Noah could have feared the doom of the flood. He was told, he, he was told that something's going to happen that probably have never happened on the earth before, rain. Because there was no mention of rain until this point, possibly. He also was told that he has to build something that God gave him very specific instructions to build, ark. We used to teach the kids here on what the word ark. We found out the Hebrew word ark means saving box, basically. God's grace. Noah saw God's grace in the middle of that, something terrifying, something he has not seen. But his faith is a testimony of that, that even though catastrophe will happen, he sees the favor of God upon his life. And when we go through these things, it is very hard to see, I've got to watch there, God is to see where, where, how am I your favorite, Lord, when this is happening? Why, 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 why is this happening? And yes, it's okay to say why. Sometimes God does not answer those questions, why. And I love Job. I'd love to do a sermon on Job because Job asked why all the time until God got to the end. And God did not answer his questions, why. He said, who am I, Job? Who am I? And it was enough to silence his why questions. Noah saw who God is. And his faith in that catastrophe brought him 
to build the ark and endure the storms. So I'm taking you to another storm, Matthew 14, 22 to 33. And it says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boats after the feeding of the 5,000 and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. I will absolutely take every opportunity to talk about Peter because Peter's my guy. He's my guy. He is an open the mouth, insert the foot kind of person. <laughs> Everybody here who knows me knows that. I am absolutely, he absolutely is amazing because when he got things right, Jesus said to everybody, who do, who do people say that I am? And they said, oh, they say, you're Elijah, one of the prophets. And that when, But when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter immediately stepped up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Like, duh. I always imagine that in a, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, duh, kind of, kind of moment. But then when he, gets, so when he gets it right, he gets it really, really right. But when he gets it wrong, he gets it really, really wrong. Now, Jesus, like I said, Jesus had just fed the 5,000, had leftovers, immediately puts the people, puts the guys into the boat, and tells them to go to the other side while he dismisses the crowd. Now, Jesus goes up then on a mountainside to pray. And the, and the boat is in the middle of then, all of a sudden, the boat's in the middle of the lake, and it's, it's buffeted by the waves. It's, it's in trouble. They're in trouble. Now, three of the four Gospels uh, record this account. The Gospel of Mark tells us that Gre the Greek word in the Gospel of Mark says that, that Jesus wasn't even planning on stopping by the boat. He was just going to walk all the way to the other side. But the disciples saw him. Because really, do you expect to see somebody walking on water? No, you do not. I want to stop this right here only to say this. There are 365 verses in the Bible that in some way say, don't fear, don't be afraid. I think God's trying to tell us something. The, one of the very first verses I ever memorized, and I certainly would if you are a scaredy cat like I am, I'm afraid of everything. I would certainly say memorize it. Put it on a little post-it note. Put it on your mirror. Recite it to yourself every day. Speak scripture over yourself. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Because when I became Christ's, November 22nd, 1975, I became a different person. I can look at everybody and say, oh, you know, that's just who I am. But you know what? It's not my nature. My nature changed when Jesus came into me because God has not given me a spirit of fear. He's given me his spirit. Therefore, I have a spirit of love. I have a spirit of power, and I have a spirit that's, that gives me a sound mind, that gives me control in a different way than I really want to be in control, I'm confessing on myself. See, faith looks differently than fear does. Fear looks out and says, it's a ghost. Be terrified. Faith looks out and says, oh, no, that's Jesus. Let's go. So faith, in the middle of terrifying circumstances and storms, sees God's grace. He will show you his grace. 
My next point just went somewhere. <laughs> here, let me. Hold on. I just tapped something here. and There it is. Okay. I married my technician. Thank God. Okay. <laughs> point number two. Faith in the middle of crisis and storms, faith in God takes us through. Many of us, when crisis comes, we can request of God that he takes it away or calms the storm, which we do have an account of, uh, so that before the worst can happen. Sometimes God does that, and he did that in one of those storms. That's a whole other sermon, too. However, sometimes, and we also can say, can you take me around this or under it or over it or something like that or just put a bubble over us and stuff. However, sometimes it happens so quickly, we're in the middle of a storm and what looks like an impossible situation, we can't see light. We can't see a way out. Now, back to Noah. God ordered him and his family to get into the ark before disaster occurs. And it says that God shut the door. It literally says God shut the door to the ark. He didn't pull it. Noah didn't have to hoist it. God shut the door. You want to talk about grace? He knew and he shut the door himself. God did that. And he put his favor on Noah and his family. But it did not stop Noah and his family hearing the rising, the swelling, and the floods happening inside of that ark. God kept them in the ark for over a year. Through the 40 days and 40 nights, they were swelling up and down, and they heard the thunderstorms. They were probably at points terrified. I don't know. We can ask him someday. Noah endured it all, but not alone. He had his faith in God to save him no matter how awful it seems. I love my other favorite book, the writer of Hebrews, says of Noah, it was by faith that Noah built a large, it says boat, I have the translation, I prefer ark, to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. I love that we, faith in storms, we see God's grace and God gives us in Jesus Christ his righteousness to get through the storms. Noah didn't beg God to relent, destroy the earth out of fear, but he obeyed God to go through it. Great faith will always do something to carry us through the promise rest in him. God carries us through every storm. Trials, crisis, and possible situations helps us to grow and develop godly character that provides strength and endurance. During this, God can take whatever we go through and he will bring out his son in our hearts and said, look what my servant is doing and going through, that I have allowed them to go through it. Faith is tested through trials, not produced by trials. Faith is tested through trials and not produced by trials. Trials reveal what faith we do have, not because God doesn't know how much faith we have, but so that our faith will be evident to ourselves and those around us. It was evident to, to Noah, and God get, made a covenant with him and the earth, and Noah worshiped God. Noah knew that God would put him and his family to go through that storm. So we left the disciples in the middle of a storm, afraid of what they thought was the ghost of Jesus. Now, here are all of these 12, and I'm not dissing these guys. Like, legit, I would be screaming in the center with my arms around the mast. I'm very, I know who I am, okay? And that is legit. But these people are people who have walked with Jesus. They've seen his miracles. This is not their first storm with him. And that storm saw them in a fear-filled frenzy again. But Jesus woke up in the middle of that storm and calmed it. But in the middle of this storm, he does not. I've always, that kind of stuff interests me because I think to myself, why? 
Why did you not stop this storm, God? Why? Why didn't Jesus just be like, hey, come, it's okay? Because there was a reason for it. Our circumstances do not determine the power of God. God is sovereign. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Spirit's job within you is to remind you of that every single day who Jesus is. Right? We have to expect the supernatural. We have to expect it. We have to come into church and say, today God's going to do something big or small. We have to expect it. These men got into this boat, and I don't think they expected that storm. These men got into this boat, and I don't think they expected Jesus to come walking on the water to them. These men got into this boat and said, let's go. And then when the storm hit, they're terrified. But do you know what? When Jesus put them in the boat, he said, get into the boat and go to the other side. There's, an, there's a promise inherent in that, and that is that you will get to the other side. When God looks at two kid people who have been in kids' ministry for 30 years and says, go plant the first Assemblies of God church ever to be planted in the highlands of Scotland, the promise is that it will be planted. That he w- because God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Right? Let's just be honest. Whatever God has called you to do, you are not up for it. But he is. And I think, I remind myself of that every single day when I look in the mirror. Your circumstances do not determine the the sovereignty of God. These gentlemen in this boat, their faith is being tested through this trial, allowing their endurance to grow. And here's my question. Here's my question. Would those gentlemen have been able to withstand the storm of the crucifixion if they had not made it through this storm? Something to think about. Point number three, faith focuses on Jesus. Your faith, the center of your faith is the Son of God, Jesus. Faith is not something that you put an emotion on. It is Jesus. Noah was so convinced of his faith in God that he did exactly what God said. He built the massive ark, which may have literally made him look like he was lost his mind, possibly. I don't know. And again, Noah was far from perfect. He had real faith that led to action. And like all real faith, Noah's led to blessing. Throughout the entire ordeal, Noah knew it was Noah knew it was about God. His focus and everything he did was about him. So I love doing this. When I read Old Testament accounts, Jesus, where are you in this? I, I, I need to find where you are. I need to find the the most wonderful treasure in this account, this story, and all the begats. And everything, you know, they'll they'll begat this and all the names I couldn't pronounce. Where are you, Jesus, in this and stuff? And I found some of them. And I just, I love doing that. And the entire account is a foreshadow, the Noah's flood, a foreshadow of Christ's baptism. When we die from a sinful world, we're resurrected to a new eternal life in Jesus. That Jesus is God's plan A, period. There's no plan B, plan C, or 4.46A, I don't know, whatever. Plan A, Jesus was crucified from the foundation of the world. Your life is part of that plan A. Your life is plan A. So when crisis happens, this is still plan A. Even in the midst of the greatest catastrophe the world had ever known, Jesus is the ultimate center of it all. It's hard to believe that a flood where Jesus is the center, this flood was about him. 
Peter in his third epistle talked about Noah's faith and how Noah's faith focused on the Son of God. Um, and I'm going to take the, the, the verse I want to focus on. I'm going to take it back a, a few verses back. So he, Jesus, this is talking about, this is Peter's uh, in his, um, did I say third epistle? First epistle, third chapter. Uh, so he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. Here's the verse. And that water is a picture of baptism which now saves you. Not by the removing of dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Spurgeon, I love Spurgeon, said of that verse, Noah was not saved by the world being gradually reformed and restored to its primitive innocence, but a sentence of condemnation was pronounced and death and burial and resurrection ensued. Noah must go into the ark and become dead to the world. The floods must descend from descend from heaven and rise upward from their secret fountains beneath the earth. The ark must be submerged with many waters. Here was burial. And then after a time, Noah and his family must come out into a totally new world of resurrection life. Noah was the heir of God's righteousness. One of them, as it says in Genesis, he knew this and saw this from a great distance. No, uh, God was infinitely concerned about that unbelieving world. And what was Noah doing? And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people in the vast flood. So that's from Second Peter. Noah was pleading from an unbelieving world, more, and if you can believe this, more, infinitely more worse than it is now. But Noah saw the salvation of God in Jesus. And his faith, he saw it from a distance, what we see in our hearts. So there's something greater than Noah here. Jesus said that. When you ask him into your hearts, in terrifying storms, which, yes, it is okay to be terrified. God understands. But in that, you will see Jesus because he will reveal himself. So the guys, they're in the boat. <clears throat> the storm is going. Gee, they've seen Jesus. T they've screamed. And Jesus has identified himself, and Peter, my guy, I would, I would never have thought of this. Okay, if you are who you say you are, bid me come out to you on the water. I memorized everything in King James, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, yeah, I know, right? I'm very old. Um, so Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell you this. Jesus knows who he is. If you are who you say you are, tell me to come out on the water. And Jesus is like, okay, come on. So here's one thing I want you to notice. Peter's circumstances had not changed. The storm is still going. The, the waves are still crashing. The boat is still being tossed around. And he, I imagine him, this is just like my imagination, but I imagine him struggling to the side of the boat. Okay, Jesus said, come out. Okay, okay. And I imagine him putting out his foot, and a wave comes and crashes, and his foot hits it, and the wave turns solid. And he steps out onto the water, and he walks toward Jesus. He gets a lot of grief, because once he realized his circumstances, he started to sink. But, but Peter got a moment with the sovereign God of the universe that no one else has ever had, because his faith... In his faith, he did what God asked him to do. He did what Jesus asked him to do. Come on, let's go. We don't know how far Peter was away from the boat before he started to sink. We just know that he looked around and realized, uh-oh, my circumstances have not changed. 
and he started to sink. But listen, this is what I want you to this is what I want you to see. The minute Peter said, "Lord, help me," Jesus did not stand there for 20 minutes and tell them, "I don't understand why you didn't believe me when I said walk on the water. I am sovereign God. You said I was the He didn't stand there and watch him sink. The Bible says he immediately It's immediately That means all all of the sudden immediately grabs him, takes him to the boat, and in one of the Gospels, it says the minute that they hit the boat, they're on the other side. Their circumstances did not change until Jesus got into the boat with them. So Mike has in his, in his hand here, and some of, the, some, of the, <laughs> some of the kids in the back may remember this from Children's Church. But this can, it's dented, it has holes in it. It's an amazingly, we had one kid on Long Island tell us, you should throw that away. But I want to tell you that this is your heart. This is my heart. This is the heart of the people in the Highlands. People who have been abused, people who have been spiritually used, people who have been hurt, bullied, whatever. It causes dents and holes in your heart. Could I get somebody to turn off the lights? But Jesus said of himself, I am the light of the world. Turn them all off, guys. Turn them down. I promise I won't fall off. We can see the edge from here. We promise. I promise. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And more than that, he told each and every one of his followers, each and every person who believes in them, you are the light of the world. So when the light of the world comes into you, he comes, when Jesus comes into you, he comes into you with all of his experiential knowledge, all that Christ is, you have access to through the Holy Spirit. They do all work. Mike is not, poor Mike, he's trying to hold the mic and do the Without dropping it. I promise I won't drop it sound, people. So when... (laughs) There we go. When Jesus comes into you, you, when you look at this can now, what you really see first is the light shining out the holes. And it's beautiful. Jesus, that's what Jesus does for us. He takes something that's holy, not holy, not H-O-W, not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y that is wholly broken and makes it into a thing of beauty. And all we have to do is trust him. Because faith sees God's grace. Faith takes you through and faith focuses on Jesus. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So, if there is anything that's terrifying you, any storm in your life that's, you don't think you could get through it, and it's ripped holes and dented your heart and things and circumstances from the past, know that the light of the world that you have asked into your heart, I'm speaking to the people who have, is in there shining through those holes and turning your dented, battered heart that went through those storms into something of beauty. If you don't know Jesus, and you would like to know Jesus, you can't get through these things alone. And you need the reassurance of a God who loves Everyone in the world, and he includes you. I'm going to tell you, he's going to say, you are worth it all to me, that I died for you. And no matter what you went through, and no matter what the size of your heart, or what uh, the, the circumstances of what your heart, or what you've been through, he is the light of the world, 
And through that pain, the world sees the light of the world. Ask him into your heart so he turns something that needs to be thrown away or the world wants to throw away and turn it into a thing of beauty. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, O oh Lord God, that you just make us into something wonderful. That, yes, you said it is good and finished and finished creation, but Lord God, thank you that you are creating a new species of people who have you in your heart. And that's all. Lord, thank you for plan A, that we're part of, all of us are part of your plan A. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you that even in terrifying circumstances, Lord, you reached out your hand and you immediately bring us up and you say, I love you and I promise to love you through eternity. So Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, O Lord God, for this church, O Lord God, that is so faithful to us. And friends, O Lord God, thank you to the pastors that lead this church that is just, their passion is in this church and has been for a long time. So, Lord Jesus, we just thank you. Thank you for the, uh, sorry, the old faces that we have seen, all our old friends. I don't mean it that way. And I look, and the new ones. <laughs> so, Lord God, thank you for family, and thank you, O oh Lord God, that we know that this church is here, so whatever crisis we go through or any things that we don't think we can go through, we know that there are people that are supporting us here, O oh Lord God, in prayer, and that love us. Lord, and know that we love them. So, Lord Jesus, it is all for you, and in your honor, we love you, Jesus. In your name, amen. You could turn on the lights there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Wow, there was something there for you, wasn't there? Going through storms. Mike, can your team come on up and let's end with some joy of the Lord, or you pick. Folks, as they're coming up, I, I just want to especially say to those of you who are not sure if you have ever asked Jesus Christ into your life to be your Savior. Maybe you've done it and you can't really remember very much about it, or if you're unsure if you've ever taken that step and you would like to, I'd just like to lead you in a prayer. If everyone here would just bow their heads close their eyes. I just want to pray this prayer. And if that's you, just, just whisper this prayer to God. Just pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. I ask you to forgive me, Lord. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to make me new. Come into my life. Heal my heart. Heal my wounds. I ask you to be my Savior. To live in me. I give my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you've prayed that and you'd like to talk to somebody, please come into classroom one after the service. We'd love to talk with you and minister to you. But for all of us who are here today, who are going through a storm, who have gone through a storm, or a storm is coming up, this is a wonderful word of encouragement to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Mike and Tina, thank you. Thank you. They're over there. There they are. They're in the back. They're in the back. Thank you so much. And, and they mean it. They're going to stick around, answer questions about Scotland. And um, it's so good to have them back. Let's stand and end our time together with a little worship.